So tonight we're going to pick up with joint types, uh, and we're going to pick up specifically with the synovial joint. And the synovial joint is the most common joint type. And it is the joint that's going to be responsible to induce skeletal movement. And in terms of the anatomy, the synovial joint is going to have two surfaces that come in contact. So two bones are going to come together. And because they are the, jo the, the joints of skeletal movement, they are going to uh, require the surfaces to be uh, very low friction surfaces. So the surfaces of each bone in the joint are going to be covered by a layer of hyaline cartilage. Now by having the surfaces covered with this hyaline cartilage, this prevents the bones from being in direct contact. And so those bones don't make contact. Now, to ensure that the joint uh, stays together and that we don't have a lot of extraneous movements in even though there's no contact, we still have a lot of structure here to support a joint. And that's what you're looking at here is the knee joint where the tibia and the femur make their contact. You can see that there is space between those two bones because the bones aren't in contact. And that space is going to be referred to as the joint cavity. And it is going to be filled with a solution that will help to further reduce friction. And that solution is just simply synovial fluid. Now, synovial fluid itself is going to be a very slippery type solution. And to be slippery or uh, the reason that it's slippery is because synovial fluid contains albumin and hyaluronic acid, both of which reduce viscosity for the synovial fluid. And then as those bones move next to each other, uh, they're moving in a near friction-free environment. Now again, the whole joint itself. What is albumin and what? Hyaluronic acid, H-Y-A-L-U-R-O-N-I-C acid, A-C-I-D. The whole joint itself is covered by a joint capsule. And this joint capsule is a fibrous material on the outside and then on the inside lining the whole joint cavity, we have a membrane called the synovial membrane. Which is really nothing more than just a layer of cells that are spaced around the joint. So you can see here that we have our, <clears throat> our joint cavity, and then surrounding the joint cavity, we have the joint capsule. 
And on the exterior, we're going to have um, a fibrous capsule, but then on the inside, we have this synovial membrane that surrounds the whole joint. And that synovial membrane is actually going to be responsible to generate the synovial fluid. It's the point source for that synovial fluid. So inside the joint capsule, the interior wall is the synovial membrane, and then we have on the outside a fibrous capsule to provide structure. Fibrous outside membrane. <clears throat> now, as you're looking at this joint, you'll see that there's actually some other things that are associated with this joint. And I'm just going to simply refer to those other things as special features. And across all of our synovial joints, we aren't necessarily going to have each one of these special features, but you may find some of these special features in some of our joints. One of those special features is what's known as an articular disc or articular discs. And these articular discs are going to be pad-like extensions from the joint capsule itself. And that's what you can see here. Extending out of the joint cap capsule. Now, in addition to the articular discs, the articular disc can become thicker, and when they are thickened, it is known as a meniscus. And so these are going to be thicker extensions. And the meniscus, in the case of something like the knee, is going to form basically a pad that sits on, on top of the tibia. And that pad of cartilage, the meniscus, is able to provide shock absorption. So if you jump up and down, it's not just bone moving on the bone. You have that padded surface to absorb that shock. Yes. So if it's just a pad, then how do people hear it? Yeah. Um, that's actually a, it's, it's, that's a reasonable question. Um, and, and really what happens is the pad, <laughs> it's shaped something like that on top of it. And you, you can kind of imagine this just being a piece. And you can tear part of it, or you can tear it like that, tear away a little chunk. Every time it's like, like the meniscus and the does that work on the same? Is it like a bone? Is it a or? Um, the, it, it could be. Most of the time, is when they have, most of the time you have some sort of injury in the joint is when you apply forces at an abnormal angle. Mm -hmm. Like you're on the soccer field and you go to kick a ball and you're standing like this and someone comes in from the side and hits your side of your knee and your knee goes like that. That's an application of a pretty abnormal force. <laughs> I have no idea why I just did that. <laughs> My meniscus is blown up. <laughs> okay, alongside the special features, we also have some attachments. And these attachments are going to make sure, under normal forces, application of normal forces, that the joint doesn't move 
way outside of its normal position. So, I mean, you're familiar with some of these, I'm sure, because you know that bones are attached to muscles through tendons, and this will provide some of our structural support. So we're going to find in joints tendons which will attach muscle to bone. And we'll find ligaments where we have bone to bone attachment. Uh, and so the ligaments, typically you will have a ligament that will basically attach between those two bones and will prevent movement in a specific direction. So you're all familiar with some uh, a ligament called the ACL, the anterior cruciate ligament. And it runs from the front to the back and it prevents that movement in this direction. So when you blow out your ACL, one of the tests that they do, they have you sit up on the table you grab onto the back of your leg and you pull, and if your leg comes out, your ACL is probably no longer attached. Uh, but there's also a PCL, a posterior cruciate ligament, which prevents that backwards motion. And then we have medial collaterals and lateral collaterals as well. And they're all structurally holding that joint so that it can, it doesn't move too far to either side, doesn't move too far back, doesn't move too, too far forward. Yeah. Actually, that's th th those are um, comorbidities, meaning that they do occasionally happen together. Mm -hmm. And part of it is probably the ACL gets ruptured or, or slacked or something, some stress on the ACL, and that allows the bone to move a lot more than it should, and it causes damage or injury to the meniscus. Mm -hmm. Okay, so those are tendons and ligaments. Um, you'll notice up here that we have, and there's a couple of them um, that you can find. These are um, structures that are known as bursa. And a bursa has a cousin called the synovial sheath. In the bursa and the synovial sheaths, these are going to be basically membranous sacs or tubes of synovial fluid. Okay, so structurally they have a sac or tube-like structure. And they contain synovial fluid. And the sac of synovial fluid is a really good cushion to control and to allow uh, smooth, smooth um, defined movement for tendons. Okay, so right here we got a bursa on the patella where the patellar tendon goes over the patella and behind the bursa, that bursa on the front of the knee, to allow that the, the patella tendon to stay right where it needs to stay. It's structurally going to uh, support that and act as a cushion for that tendon's passage. guide the tendons. Okay, so there's the basic anatomy for our major types of joints. Um, in, now, specific to the synovial joint, I want to begin to talk about analyzing and describing movements of synovial joints. And whenever we deal with synovial joints, we have to model them. These are very complex uh, complex mechanical structures, and it's good if we can provide some sort of model for predictions or descriptions of movement. So we're going to use uh, a model for joints centered around levers. So joints are modeled as levers. 
And what you can see here, there are three different types of levers, class one through class three. And in the middle here, so you got the, the type of le lever here with just a sort of a, a diagram. And then a more practical application for those types of levers. And then the anatomical representation where we might find that certain type of lever. Okay. So joints are modeled as levers, especially our synovial joints. We have three types of levers to choose from. And I'll start with the first class lever. So what is this? A seesaw, teeter powder. And that's an example of a first class lever. So what you can see is we have three different things force and the load, and then this is the fulcrum. Sometimes force is referred to as the effort. The load can also be referred to as the carriage or something along those terms, or the resistance. Um, so for a first class lever, we are going to have some sort of resistance or load or weight or carriage. And then our fulcrum. And then our effort. And in this case, the effort, we're going to give it a vector of direction. And that's going to be down. Okay, so you're on the teeter totter, and how do you make your friend go up? You basically try to sit down, and how do you make him go down really quick? You jump off. <laughs> And usually they come down and they bite the metal bar, and it's like this old, rusty, like, yeah, guaranteed tetanus. <laughs> <laughs> so the picture that you're seeing here uh, on the on the image, this is a muscle that's going to provide the effort or the force. Okay, so you can track that muscle. The load is the front part of the face, and then the fulcrum is going to be be right where the cranium or the skull sets on um, on atlas, the, the C2 vertebrae. So you lean your head back and lift up the load to be in the front part of your face and your chin, and this is a class one lever. Now, notice that we could begin to uh, ascribe distances in here and put some quantities to this. We can measure that. And we're actually going to do that here in just a few minutes, just kind of giving you a little bit of preview of what's coming. So the force is actually the muscle? Yeah, the force in, in, in human anatomy is going to be generated by the muscle. Our second class levers, the second class lever, we are going to reposition the fulcrum, and we're going to put the resistance in the middle. So we're going to basically switch these two items here. So there's our fulcrum. And then we'll have our load or our resistance. And then we'll have our effort. And now the effort is actually going to be in the other direction this time. And what's this? Wheelbarrow. Wheel you apply the force to the handles, the fulcrum is around the axis on the wheel, and whatever you put into the barrow is the, the load that you can move. So an anatomical example would be when you do calf raises. The ful fulcrum will be the tips of your toes, or will be the, 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 <laughs> the, uh, the uh, phalanges. And then the force is being applied by the gastrocnemius. And the load is everything that's in the body, or everything that's sitting on top of, of, of the legs. So now notice that uh, we might have some different distances here. This is a little bit longer. This is a little bit shorter, where these are basically pretty close to being the same way. 
All right, third class lever. The third class lever. Now we've moved the load and the force. We're switching load and force. So effort would be in the middle. Yep, effort is going to be in the middle. So we'll have our fulcrum, and then we're going to have our effort. And then we are going to have the load out here towards the end. Anyone happen to know what that is? The bottom here. I think what they're trying to illustrate there is it is um, a uh, water pump. And so you apply the force by the fulcrum, and it pulls up and down on the on the uh, pump mechanism that's usually in the ground. I'm not really too sure exactly what that is. This is going to be our bicep. Okay, so we have our bicep. That actually the tendon of the bicep. So you do need to, in, in anatomical terms, you need to kind of have an idea where the muscles are inserting, because the bicep. You would think, oh yeah, bicep. So if the bicep's applying load. Bicep, and then the fulcrum is the is the um, elbow, and then the load. So force by the muscle, fulcrum at the elbow, and then the load is in the hand. Okay, so if it's fulcrum, I'm sorry, if it's um, not fulcrum, if it's force, fulcrum, load, what type of lever would it would it be? But it's not right, and that's because actually. The bicep tendon is on the other side of the elbow. So the, the, the elbow is actually the first, the first part of that lever. The elbow is the fulcrum. Then the load or the uh, force is being applied because that's where the tendon attaches into the forearm. It's on the distal side of the elbow joint. And then the load is in the hand. That's one of the most common issues that students will have is they won't Think about where the where the tendon is actually attached, and so they're like, "Oh yeah, it goes muscle, which is my force, my fulcrum, and then my load, and then they call it class one, and really it's class three. So fulcrum, effort, and load. Okay, so this would be hand, tendon of the bicep, elbow joint, and that's why this last example here is a third class lever. Mm -hmm. Now. How can you actually learn these and memorize these? Is there any tricks that you can actually use? And the trick that I try to use is I memorize these two, class two and class three, so that it's fulcrum load force, fulcrum force load, two, three. And then put the fulcrum in the middle, and it's class one. So these are the harder ones to memorize because with the fulcrum in the middle, it doesn't matter if I draw it this way with force and load or if I draw it this way with load and force. That's still the same lever. It's a class one lever, right? So as long as the fulcrum's in the middle, it's class one. You just really need to know these two, class two and three. Class two, load's in the middle. Class three, the force is in the middle. So really, you only need to remember two load, three force. Two load, three force. And you know all three of those. Two load, three force. So why would I want to model my joints like levers? Well, really, why do we want to use levers is probably a better question to ask at first. Why do we use levers? It makes the job a lot easier. You go out to your car and you have to change the tire. You're pretty fortunate that you don't have to reach under there and lift the thing up and change the tire with the other hand. But you can go out there with a jack and you know you get a, a jack that has you know four or five foot handle on there and, and that thousand pounds in the front of your car just goes right up. 
and you're only pushing, you know, 10 pounds of, of force. So it makes the job a lot easier. Uh, I'm going to refer to that phenomenon of making the job easier with a lever. I'm going to say that levers create mechanical advantage. Now, mechanical advantage, as you can see here, um, we're using a couple different types of tools that are actually two different types of levers to create this mechanical advantage. And what you should notice is that based off of where the force and the effort and the I'm sorry, the, uh, the load, the effort, or force, and the fulcrum, wherever those are located, we can model each of those as a segment with a, with a known distance. We can quantify it. So I can come over here to Andrew Neal, and I can say, hey, I want to know what your mechanical advantage is for your bicep. And I could measure the distance between the elbow and then where the ligament attaches, and it's probably about a centimeter, and then measure from the fulcrum up to where it's carrying the weight, and it might be 15 centimeters. I've just quantified that, and now I can go through and I can calculate what type of mechanical advantage does he have. Does he have the ability to lift up the front end of a car? <laughs> so we can calculate and quantify mechanical advantage. I'm just going to call that MA. And mechanical advantage, the equation we're going to use here is LE over LR. E stands for effort, R stands for resistance. The L stands for length. So LE is going to be the effort leg, the length of the effort leg or the effort segment. And the way that we're going to quantify the effort leg is going to be simply the distance between the effort and the fulcrum. The LR is our resistance leg, distance of the resistance leg or segment. And that's just simply going to be quantified as the distance between the resistance and the fulcrum. So the distance between the resistance and the fulcrum. So if I wanted to calculate this, and we're actually going to go through calculation in just a second, but um, I really have to be able to identify both of those segments. And I have to be able to identify them very, very clearly. So in the first picture here, what is LE? It's the distance between the effort and the fulcrum. So here's my effort, and here's my fulcrum. It's 25 centimeters. What if I were to switch the load and the fulcrum? Then what would my LE quantify out to? So I switch that quarter centimeter there. Now I'm still measuring from effort to the fulcrum, so it's 25.25 centimeters. A lot of times people will get in there and they're like, oh, okay, so here's one segment and then here's the other segment, not realizing that sometimes you're going to have situations, which is what we have going down here, where the... Uh, Effort leg is contained within the resistance leg. And so some people would be like, oh, okay, so my effort leg is 25 centimeters. My resistance leg from here to here is 25 centimeters, but it's from the fulcrum to the load. Does that make sense? Kind of what I'm stepping in there? Sorry. It just keeps switching back and forth. So effort, you mean force? And is it mm -hmm. okay. I'm doing it on purpose too. Well, I get a little. Um, 
Okay, that's fine. We'll just move on until you catch up. Okay, no, no. Thank you. Okay, so like, it's like, he was using here, like he's um, in the boat and he's using the arm, so the effort is coming from this part, so it's just from this part. Okay. Um. I just want to take a look at this. Yeah, so this is a bicep. So we're dealing with what kind of leverage, you know? Third. Yep, third. And it goes fulcrum effort resistance. So I need to quantify. So let me draw this on the board. Actually, I'm just going to go back because we already have a picture here. We're basically dealing with this lever right here. So if I want to quantify. What's going on here with my arm? <laughs> There's my bicep. This is my fulcrum right here. My tendon attaches in over here. And then this is where the paddle is being held. Okay? So we need to we need to discover L E and we need to discover L R. L E is fulcrum to effort. And so it's actually really very small because it's that distance right there because that's the fulcrum and that's the effort. So this is effort and then this is going to be resistance for load. Okay? LR is the distance between the resistance and the fulcrum. Resistance is here, fulcrum is here. So it's going to go that distance there. Does that make sense? Yeah. So LE is actually contained within LR, in a sense, because the fulcrum is on the very end of the, uh, of the chain, fulcrum, effort, resistance. Whereas with a class 1, like a seesaw, class 1 seesaw, fulcrum is always going to be in the middle, right? Fulcrum is always here in the middle. And so your distances, LE is, is going to be one of those legs, and LR is going to be the other leg. But with the other types of class 2, class 3 types of lever, you have the fulcrum at the very end. And so fulcrum to load and fulcrum to effort. Fulcrum to effort, fulcrum to load. They're going to be kind of laying on top of each other, those two different legs. Is this, are you clear what's going on here? So most people will get in there and they'll try to start to dissect that and they'll be like, like this one, they'll be like, oh, okay, so it's fulcrum to effort and then the other segment must just be this segment there. And they're off because they're missing that por portion of the, of the model. Okay, so... What is the reason that we would use something like a mechanical advantage? And then we're going to do another practical <laughs> example. As mechanical advantage increases, and so this increase is tending towards infinity, we're going to have a higher amount of power, but we're going to have a trade-off with speed and distance. Have any of you ever seen um, how they used to move old train cars around, like old box cars? Well, there were, there were those pulleys, but the, the uh, engineer also used to use a big lever that looked about like that. And they would hold on to it, and they'd go up to the wheel, and they would put that on there, and this is a giant lever, and they would move, and they could move at great distances because of that long effort arm. So this would be a fulcrum right here. This is where we're putting the effort. This is the resistance or the load. That's the train car. And they would move it. And those train cars are tens of thousands of pounds. They would have to generate a amount of effort. You're talking maybe five kilograms. And the train car would start to move. But it would only go very slowly and a very short amount of distance. And so they have to set it up again. 
and just continue moving that train car along the tracks. So very high power, you can move lots of weight, but a very low amount of speed and distance that you can move that load. Whereas mechanical advantage decreases, so tends towards zero, you have a decrease in power, but an increase in speed and distance. So like down here, this guy who's shoveling rocks or dirt or whatever, he's not able to move probably more than 50 or 60 pounds, but he can move it a long distance and pretty quick. You've all probably shoveled before, and you're not going, you're going and moving that a long distance as you use that lever. Okay, so... What you need to be able to do is not only calculate the mechanical advantage, but also get an idea about the uh, type of mechanical advantage you have. Do you have a large mechanical advantage or lot high power, low speed, or do you have a low mechanical advantage, low power, but high speed? So this is tending towards infinity, but in all reality, as we get greater than one, we're going to consider that a pretty large mechanical advantage. Whereas over here, if we're below one, we're going to consider that a pretty low mechanical advantage. Okay? So you need to calculate, and then you need to know tending towards affinity or higher than one, high mechanical advantage, high amount of power, but low speed and distance, and then mechanical advantage tending towards zero, lower than one, decrease in power, but a high amount of speed and distance. All right, so let's take a look here. Let's see if we can let's see if we can do one of these. So here's a diagram. My resistance is here. My fulcrum is here. It's supposed to be an F, not an E. Fulcrum, and then over here is my effort. So what else could I put in there? What what is another way to say resistance? Load. I think I heard load. Yep, load. And how about effort? We can call that force. And there's our fulcrum. Okay, so let's say that's two centimeters and that's four centimeters. Can you provide me a mechanical advantage and tell me what type of mechanical advantage I have? So, what's our equation? Mechanical advantage. Always start like this. Mechanical advantage equals equals um, L E over L. Okay, L E over L R. So, so what is L E? Okay, and how did you get four centimeters? Because it's from it's the effort, so it's the length. Yep, effort to fulcrum. So four, and how about L R? Resistance to the fulcrum, and that is 2. So 4 divided by 2 equals 2. What kind of mechanical advantage do we have? High. High mechanical advantage. And so what does that mean for power, speed, and distance? Power? High power? Low speed and distance. 